Good morning, everyone. Hi, I'm Martin. I'm a product manager here at JetBrains uh, for Kotlin Build Tools. And today I wanted to talk to you about universal Gradle best practices and when to adopt them uh, in your project. Uh, before we continue, let's do a quick show of hands. Who started using Gradle in the last year? Okay. Who started using Gradle in the last three years? Okay. Who is using Gradle? Okay, cool. <laughs> Before we move on, let's address the elephant in the room. Gradle is powerful. Whatever you want from the build system, Gradle can do, and probably more. But getting good scalable setup is hard. And what I mean by good setup? The good setup doesn't drive you crazy. So it doesn't drive you crazy both in terms of like build times, but it also doesn't drive you crazy every time you want to change something. And scalable setup means that as you grow your application, as you're adding modules, you don't have to significantly change your build setup. And as we all remember from our first days learning Gradle, this can be hard. There is a lot of bells and whistles in Gradle, and sometimes people say that, you know, like learning how to do things in Gradle is learning how to pilot a jumbo jet. It will get you anywhere, but there's a lot of buttons to press, and there's a lot of buttons to not press. So, early last year, we did the research. Uh, I talked with uh, a few dozen developers about their Gradle build setup. What's there? What plugins are they using? What problems are you facing? What problems did you face in the past? And before this research, I had this hypothesis. That as your project grows, it's a bit painful to learn Gradle, but you arrive at the happy place. What I learned was a bit surprising to me. It turns out that learning Gradle is easy, but you arrive in not a very happy place. And then it takes tremendous amount of energy to fix your build when it reaches some scale. And by tremendous amount, I'm saying that I've heard stories about 18 to 24 months of refactor, a live operation and the build until developers were happy with what they were working with. So this, uh, this talk is primarily based on this. It's the aggregation of all of the best practices of the most universal ones uh, that a lot of people wish they'd adopted at the start, or in general they adopted and they were happy with and they stick with it. So let's start with the, I would say, like the most basic one, but at the same time the most universal one, and that's dependencies. Uh, Every single application will have at least one dependency when we are past the learning Kotlin phase. And, you know, from a software engineering point of view, like as a code, this is not a great line of code, right? It has magic strings, it has magic numbers, uh, it's about importing Kator and using Kator, but there is a lot of characters here in order to parse it. By now, we are probably used to it, but still, it's not perfect. Also, if I want to change the version of Kator, I have to change all of the three versions in sync, so I have to change it in three places. Now, if I have five modules, I have to change it in 15 places. That's 15 places that I can make an error. Now, the version catalog is a catalog, it's a reference of libraries that you use in your project, and uh, you can assign them human-readable names, uh, you can extract the versions to separate uh, variables, and then your build files look like this. So you reference those human-readable names, you get autocomplete, uh, so it's the build script itself is significantly uh, like easy to read, uh, you have central place for your um, library, so it means that if I want to bump the Kator version, I have only one place to do. It also means that if, for example, you have security audit, you point the guy only um, to, to, to one place, and th that person can you know, like check all of the things in one place, instead of going through the whole build script. Also, it's a great place for discovering if you have a gr bigger project, if someone already solved some problem and is using library for a problem that you're looking for a solution, maybe there is a higher chance that you will reuse the same library as opposed to adding additional dependency that does more or less the same thing. And also, there are some cool uh, things in version catalog. Uh, there are bundles. If you have a set of libraries that are using at the same time, you can bundle them together and then find the bundle. And then in your build script, you just refer the bundle. Uh, okay, now let's move a bit to the build performance. Uh, imagine the following scenario that we definitely went through. So you're on a branch, you're working on a feature, 
your build takes amount of time. It makes sense. You're starting from scratch. It takes a lot of time. The next build will be shorter. Incremental build in Gradle kicks in, and it's significantly shorter. But now, if we change a branch, let's say we're checking a PR and we would like to test something, how does it work? The build will take, again, a long time. It makes sense. It's a different code, so it needs to be rebuilt from scratch. But now, when we go back to the original branch, the build actually takes, again, is a full build. Because incremental build only looks at the last build uh, that was before, and here the code changed. And as you probably guessed from the title of the slide, there is a build cache in, in Gradle. It's not enabled by default. If you go to Gradle properties, you can enable the caching. And then when you go back to branch, it will be shorter. So it can reuse the outputs of builds from before on the same machine. And if you go to some additional um, uh, hurdles and enable remote um, uh, build cache, then you can even reuse the cache between uh, different machines like CI. Uh, second similar thing is about configuration cache. When we are building, under the hood, the build is composed from two phases, right? We have configuration phase, when the Gradle prepares our build, it compiles the build script, prepares all the dependencies, and there is the actual uh, build phase. Now, if we do another build, whatever small the change is, there will still be configuration phase, and of course, there will be still build phase, even if we didn't change anything in the build script. And Gradle has cache for that. So in Gradle properties, you can enable the configuration cache, and then the configuration phase will be cached, assuming that you didn't change anything in the build script, and then the build time will be significantly smaller. For smaller projects, the gains may not be that, bar that large, but if you have a large project uh, with multiple modules and you're doing just tiny change, it may be that actually build phase is smaller than the configuration phase, and you will save a lot of time reducing the significantly the, the, the feedback loop and speeding up your work. Uh, one word of caution is that the configuration phase may not be super straightforward to set up. In general, it's easy to enable configuration cache at the start and keep your project's con configuration cache friendly. So my advice would be to turn it on, see what happens. If it works out of the box, that's great, free money. Uh, but if it doesn't work out of the box, it may require some work, so you may decide to postpone the investment week, month, a quarter, but probably the investment will be, uh, will be worth it. Uh, finally, modularize your project. The way it works in Gradle is that if you have a project and we have a simple project here, we have some utils, and then we have two features that depend on utils. If all of that is only in one Gradle module, and we change something in one feature, Gradle will rebuild the whole model, and the build time will be long. Now, if we have the same structure, but they are in three different builds, and we change something in, again in that uh, one feature, we provided additional information to Gradle, and Gradle can be smart. Gradle will only build that particular model and will significantly save you, save you time. So, modularize your project for longer, larger project, it say, can save a lot of time. Finally, going bit, back a bit to readability of the build scripts and kind of scalability of your build scripts, uh, let's look at the following application. We have an app model, and it depends on the utils model. We see here some shared parts. They are both Kotlin JVM application, they both use JUnit platform, and they both target JVM version 21. The build scripts here are quite short, so we can easily see it and I can summarize, okay, this is Kotlin JVM application targeting JVM 21 using JUnit. But if the build script is longer, it's getting harder and harder to understand what more or less this build script is about and what is specific for the particular model. Now, if I want to add another model, it's getting harder and harder to understand which are the shared parts, which parts I should copy and which parts I shouldn't copy. Now, if I want to change the JVM version or how we are doing uh, JUnit, uh, how we are doing the unit tests, then I have that many places that I have to change at that many places that I can make a mistake. And here comes convention plugins. Uh, they live in a separate place in your uh, Gradle project, and they look like this. I just extracted the shared logic here. I apply the Kotlin plugin. I apply set the JVM version. I set up the uh, the, the, the testing. And now, 
my build files look significantly simpler. Instead of this, I have this, and instead of the utils, I have this. And you see here the application of the convention plugin. The convention plugin can be a bit um, time consuming to set up. There is an investment at the start, but once you do that, the next convention plugin is easy and changing things in convention plugin is very easy. So it is an investment in the start, but you will thank yourself in the later when you do it. Uh, okay, so summing it up. Use version catalog, use build cache, use configuration cache, modularize your project, and share build logic. Now, what can go wrong? Um, we did an exercise that we thought, okay, some of the things are expensive to set up, so let's add them to the default Kotlin project in IntelliJ IDEA. And this is the result. We don't really have any Kotlin code here, but there are six Gradle files. And for a person just starting with Kotlin, if they decided to not go the IntelliJ build system, but directly to Gradle, then it will look like this. Yeah, slide. <laughs> so, there is time for everything, and it's about grading your setup right at the right time. So, let's recap once again. Use version catalog from the start. There is no reason not to. Build cache and configuration cache, the, the earlier you start in your project, the easier it is. Modularization of the project is already a cost, so not every project makes sense to modularize. If you're working on a microservice or in a small application like Kotlin Convap, you probably don't need to heavily modularize your project. But if you're asking yourself, should I modularize my project? The answer is probably yes, and you will gain the benefit of it. And as you uh, grow your project, you add your models, like if you have at least three models, probably you're already starting to having some common shared patterns and extract the build logic uh, to the convention plugin, and you will thank yourself in the future. Finally, when you're introducing new things from Gradle, it's worth to keep in mind the Gradle expertise of others in your team. If you come to this talk, probably there is a reason you, there is probably a chance that you don't like fully hate Gradle and never want to touch it. But at the same time, if you're introducing something new, keep in mind that you also have to, uh, you know, let your other team, uh, let your teammates know what you're doing, how does it work, so that you don't end up being the only person that can modify it and, you know, being this Gradle expert in living in Kathmandu mountains doing all the work around Gradle. So if I would like you to take away one thing from this presentation, is this slide. But there is a second thing. I talked about universal Gradle best practices, the ones that apply to virtually almost any project, uh, but there are way more buttons in the Jumbo Jet. So there is also way more uh, best practices on what to use, how to use some different um, pitfalls, food guns. And starting with Gradle 8.14, there is actually a dedicated section about Gradle best practices in the Gradle documentation. Uh, like it's available in the, you can either go through the link or just Google for it. And um, right now there is, uh, there are sections for different uh, aspects. For example, you can recognize using version catalog. Here are some other uh, best practices for the for the dependencies. It's just a start. Right now there is like 11 uh, best practices there, but the plan is to have around 70. Uh, so uh, take a look right now. Uh, if you don't find anything that useful for you, take a look in three months, take a look in six months, take a look in 12 months. Regardless whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or an expert writing uh, like plugins and publish them, you'll find something uh, for yourself uh, there. Um, okay, uh, so thank you all for listening. I hope that you learned something useful. Uh, and don't forget to vote. This was my first Kotlin Conf talk, so uh, I'm eager to hear how I did. Uh, and also, uh, there is no Q&A after this talk, but if you have any questions or would like to talk about uh, Gradle and Kotlin or other build system, I will be the Kotlin Conf booth and find me there before or after the lunch. Thank you. <laughs>